So welcome to this Genmig Research Webinar on migrant, on migrant Women's Entrepreneurship. My name is Celine Boloz and I'm Senior Research Officer in the Migration Research and Publications Division in IOM in Geneva. So for those of you for whom it is the first time being at a Genmig event, uh, just a few words on Genmig. Uh, Genmig is the Gender and Migration Research Policy Action Lab, which was launched in March 2023 by our Deputy Director General for Operations, Uwe Shidenos. Uh, GenMIG aims to leverage the vast knowledge and expertise of IOMM, but also of its partners, to drive actions for addressing gendered vulnerabilities guided by an evidence-based, rights-based, and migrant-centered approach. Uh, GenMIG is supported by a global network of over 500 partners now, who represents over 300 research institutions, governments, UN agencies, and other intergovernmental organizations, non-governmental organizations, uh, and the private sector, all committed to gender equality. We're guided by a multi-stakeholder approach to deliver gender-responsive solutions and to strengthen uh, migrants' resilience through actions. Uh, and to date, we have hosted about uh, uh, nearly, I should say, 20 virtual events that uh, have um, been attended by over 1,000 persons. This has included a uh, dialogue session. Those are private dialogue sessions that we held with Genmic partners, but also public events such as research webinars as we have today as well as other public events we do for especially linked to international days, such as International Migrants Day, International Women's Day, side events at the UN General Assembly and the Global Forum on Migration and Development, for instance. And you can find more information on GenMIG on the GenMIG website. The link has been shared in the chat. Um, the partnership with GenMIG is very informal, and if you'd like to join our GenMIG Partner Network, I invite you to fill the form that is being shared as well in the chat. Thank you very much to my colleague, Michaela, uh, for this. So within this context, the GenMIG uh, public research webinar series would give you the opportunity to hear from researchers on a breadth of topics related to migration and gender, and we hope that this series will, come, will go some way to improve knowledge sharing on the issues and topics that must affect uh, migrant women and that render migration and displacement deeply gendered processes. Today's webinar, as I mentioned before, will explore the intersection of gender migration and entrepreneurship in diverse global contexts, including displacement settings, focusing on how gender shapes access to resources, social networks, and opportunities for migrants. It will highlight how entrepreneurship serves as a critical resilience strategy during crisis and beyond, with an emphasis on supporting migrant women entrepreneurs and addressing the broader impact of gender migration and on global developments. Uh, migrant entrepreneurship has been a key topic in migration research. We know that entrepreneurship is often seen as a way for migrants to make valuable contribution to both the countries of origin and destination. And in destination countries, we often highlight that migrants create jobs, drive innovation, and enrich local cultures. And simultaneously, they support their home countries through remittances and by fostering uh, economic ties. From small businesses to major companies, migrants are often depicted as resourceful, creative, innovative, creating valuable job opportunities for others, locals, and migrants alike. On the one end of the spectrum, setting up one's own business may be a lifeline for displaced persons, a way to reconstruct their lives. And on the other hand, founders and CEOs of migrant backgrounds are often presented as key to the success of tech companies and startups around the globe. Such success stories, however, may mask uh, gender inequalities. And successful women entrepreneurs are essential for broader economic development as they create, they create businesses, generate jobs, and reinvest in their families and communities. And despite this, women only make up about a quarter of new business owners globally. Gender biases and systemic barriers, such as inadequate legal protections and limited access to capital, continue to impede progress for women entrepreneurs, and currently less than half of the necessary legal provision to support female entrepreneurship are implemented worldwide. 
So the challenges of starting and scaling a business are amplified for women who not only face gender bias, but also discrimination tied to the, to the nationality and immigration status. And data from selected countries in the World Bank's entrepreneurship database revealed that in 2022, foreign or non-national non women business owner, owners <clears throat> sorry, are outnumbered by men five to one. And the gap is similarly stark uh, for sole proprietors, where there are four times fewer women than men. Women migrant entrepreneurship is nevertheless key to achieving the SDGs by promoting gender equality, reducing poverty, and driving economic growth. And that's why it's important to empower uh, migrant women to foster innovation, job creation, and reduce inequalities that make them vital, contrib vital contributors to inclusive and sustainable uh, global developments. So thank you very much for being here today uh, to discuss more in detail uh, this important topic. And I gave a very brief overview here, but there's a, a few numbers and figures that we wanted to drop uh, for the broader contest. And without further ado, I leave the floor to my colleague, Jenna Nasiri, who is research officer with us uh, at the Migration Research and Publications Division. Thank you very much, Jenna. Thank you, Celine, and thank you all to, uh, for joining us today and for our panelists um, for being here with us today and to, to share more about their research. I will first introduce uh, Dr. Dina uh, Niziku, a senior lecturer in business and enterprise at the University of West Scotland. Uh, so the floor is yours, Dina. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Jenna, and thank you so much, Celine, for inviting me to be part of this uh, uh, talk today. Um, hey, Dina, sorry, we do see your uh, presenter notes if you want to oh, okay. um, change the setting there. Yep, thank you. Yep, sorry, just a minute. Okay. Okay, I think good now. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, as her, um, Jenna and uh, Celine have introduced to me, my name is Dina Nziku. I'm from the University of West of Scotland. I'm a lecturer in business and enterprise, but at the same time, I'm a, uh, I'm a researcher as well. But part of all oh, the biggest portion of my research. I like talking to women, women of different backgrounds. So in today, I'll be sharing with you actually a very detailed work that I have done with my co-authors and research team on um, forcibly displaced refugee women entrepreneurs here in Glasgow, in Scotland, because I'm in Scotland at the moment. So this is that was done in Scotland and uh, the paper has already been published. It is on in the journal, and we have got also the academic, um, the the book chapter in one of the book. I'll be show, sharing with you the references at the end of my presentation. So I would like now to embark on unveiling the entrepreneurship among forcibly displaced the refugee women entrepreneurs. So this topic, as you can see, there's enthusiasm in me. Is that uh, it's a topic that is. Uh, very underestimated, not so many people who, uh, who are researching about refugee women entrepreneurs in displaced locations. Most of the, 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 the studies that are being done, they tend to put refugee women in displaced places together with uh, other migrants, which uh, it's not that much uh, true and it's not the realistic because the truth is uh, refugee entrepreneurs and other migrants, these are two different categories and uh, when it comes to running or operating or starting up the businesses, the two different groups have got two different challenges. So what I'm gonna be talking to you today, I'll start with setting up the context and I'll uh, talk a little bit about the burning issues or the burning questions that we have for our research and then the significances of uh, refugee, my, uh, refugee women entrepreneurs here in Scotland, in Glasgow. And then I will share with you key challenges that the, our study went on uncovering. And then we'll talk a little bit about the resilience and the impact 
policy implications and I will give you a little bit of how our study went on concluding this work. As I said, that the references for this work will be shared with you all later on. So when we are talking of uh, entrepreneurship, we all know that it is that process of managing or starting managing and uh, running own businesses. However, when we talk of women entrepreneurs, meaning that we are talking now key actor being a woman, but forcibly displaced refugees, these are people or individuals who have been forced to free their places, not because they wanted to leave their places or not because they wanted to go in a certain country, but these people have been forced either because they were threatened of, uh, of death, maybe because of the, the risk of dying or because of war, or probably sometimes it might be some violences within their families. And those kind of circumstances have forced them to flee. While if we're talking of migrants, migrants, these are a different group of people who decides themselves to leave and go into another country, either for better opportunities or for economics again, or for education, or some of them, they tend to move to another country for family reunification, re, re, reunifications. So if we were looking onto these and trying to look onto why are they setting up their own business? Now, let us forget about the migrants because my research was not on migrants. My research was on refugee women entrepreneurs, forcibly displaced women entrepreneurs who lives in Glasgow. That is where we took our sample. So we tried to look on what is really motivating this woman to start their own businesses? As I've said that, well, the reason why they left their countries, it's not because they wanted to leave their countries. And some of them, they just want to leave empty-handed with nothing and probably they leave and on the way they scatter apart with their families to the, to the extent that they find that they're either by themselves, either their families have been killed behind or other family members might end up in, uh, uh, end up in another different countries from where they are. But what is really motivating these people to start business? These were the key questions that we wanted to ask women, uh, refugee women entrepreneurs here in Scotland. And then we also needed it to, uh, to, to understand what is, uh, what is making them or what is allowing or enabling them to be able to identify opportunities? As you can know that, well, if you're just like new in a place, how can you identify a business opportunity in a place? And together with that, we, uh, we went on say, uh, trying to learn and try to understand any supporting systems of this, uh, this forcibly displaced the, uh, refugee women entrepreneurs who lives in Glasgow. From the Scottish government, and again, when we're talking of the Scottish government, we, we are linking with the Westminster in, in London, uh, which is setting up the policies for the entire country as the United Kingdom. And then we tried to look on to the policies that are being set. Are they really fostering the entrepreneurship among this group? Now, the reason to why these women are starting their own businesses we went on finding that the majority of them it's for economic independence. They want to to have that freedom or gain the in, or regain the independence, their own independence when they are uh, when they have some monies. And some of them they wanted to start their own businesses or they wanted to set up the entrepreneurial ventures because they wanted to utilize their skills, uh, skills that they had from their own home countries. And some of them, because they wanted to integrate with the, the local communities, because by doing businesses, they, that was opening a door or giving them an opportunity to be able to talk with other people within the host countries. And uh, like always, empowerment, any woman who is doing a business will end up on being empowered, not just because they are doing business, but we have already seen that they will be financially empowered. They will be able to create or develop their own networks, and they will also be able to have an opportunity to, 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 to learn things within their local communities or within their host countries. But what is the significance of this fossil forcibly uh, displaced women entrepreneurs or these refugee women entrepreneurs. As I said, that were gaining control over their lives in the host communities was the major or was the, 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 the key motive for these people to start their business. But that doesn't go without any challenges. When we were talking with these women, we felt that they were very enthusiastic with starting up their own businesses in a host countries, but they are facing a lot of challenges which is together with uh, 
language barriers. Remember, I said these people were forced to leave their countries. Not they were they were so when it means that they didn't have any choice. If they had choice, probably if they are from French speaking country, they would have gone to the French French speaking country. But because they are running. In, uh, in 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 a situation where they don't choose where to go, all what they are looking is to look for a place where they will be safe. So there is a problem of language barriers, cultural adjustments, because the, the culture of the country where they flee in is not the same as where they're coming from. These people also, they don't have resources because they are not native to that country. And also by being a refugee, yes, some of them, they, they end up on getting the refugee status where they are, protected by the international law. But uh, when it comes to resources, banks uh, or any other financial institutions does not recognize these people. They don't have any credibilities that can allow them to even acquire some resources. And as I said again, when they are new into these countries, uh, they are lacking network because they don't know anybody in these uh, host countries. Uh, and it takes time for them to get integrated with the communities and get to know other people. But at the very same time, some of these women have been running their businesses and living with trauma. Now, trauma depends on how did they flee their countries? What have caused them to flee their countries? And uh, as I said, well, it depends with the nature of violence that was, 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 had caused them to flee their countries eh? that will lead up to these people or these women living with trauma for a long period of time. Because eh, some of the women that we were talking with them, they even gave us an example of how they have been struggling to, 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 to overcome their barriers or their challenges of sleeping and having nightmares because of uh, thinking of the past that they have gone through. Yet, we managed to see that these people, these women are still exhibiting a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of resilience in their activities. Now, with these challenges that I have mentioned, these were more of personal, but there are some other challenges that are beyond personal challenges that I have mentioned. And these are challenges that are either caused by governments and now it's not that because the government wants to to cause uh, challenges to these women so that they shouldn't run business, but it's because of the policies that are not affecting or policies that does not allow this woman to be able to access some funding because of who they are, because of lack of the, 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 the knowledge or the, the, the background of these people. So no any bank that can give them any loans. The Westminster government also have got that national immigration policies, which it is impacting flexibility. So there is no much flexibility for these refugee women. And here in Glasgow, we went on realizing Glasgow Local Council Authority have got these zoning regulations. Now, with zoning regulations, it means that these women entrepreneurs, it doesn't matter where they are, but they cannot set up their own business wherever they think that it is appropriate for them to run their business or where they can get their customers. And on top of that also, we went on realizing that, well, there is not much support for this group. And that lack of support also, it depends on how long they have been in the country as refugees and whether they have already acquired those uh, refugee status paperwork that will allow them to be able to integrate and be able to even get a little bit of some support from governments. Now, if you don't have that, meaning that even if you're running business, you're not going to have even a mentorship support or the training from the local, uh, from the local community. But as I said that, well, the resilience of these women, uh, for forcibly displaced women entrepreneurs in Glasgow has got a very major impact economic wise because as we have already seen that first of all themselves as refugees they want to adapt with the new environment that's why they're setting up their community their, their, their own businesses and also they need to learn new skills now you're not going to be able to start learning new skills in a new country if you're not resilient enough to be able to do that and at the very same time their resilient is uh, allowing them to be able to, pers uh, to, to to persevere despite of challenges. Yes, they go, they, 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 they lose or sometimes they fail, but still they bounce back and they manage to keep on working and do their jobs. Now, within the community Sorry, of the country, yes? Sorry, Dina, just about two minutes to wrap up. Yes, okay, yeah, I have one to go. So within their own communities, we have found that these refugee women are 
also causing some social impact of creating jobs, not for themselves, but some of these refugee women have been able to also create some jobs, job opportunities for the people of the host countries. And also they are hosting, they're, they're, they're fostering that uh, social integration. Now, police-wise, we were recommending that Scottish government should be ta- should be forming some some policies that would be tailored in providing special support for refugee women entrepreneurs because as i said that refugee they have got different challenges from other immigrants with different backgrounds here in scotland they have got a, a no one left behind police which is the scottish government police but when we went on studying this policy we felt that still there were a, a lot of, uh, of of some barriers and challenges because uh, as we can see that, well, these women cannot access finances because of the time that they, that they live in the community up to the time when they are granted with that refugee status. And finally, we thought that, well, uh, in, as part of our contribution into our, our, our research, into our research was to making sure that, well, uh, the, the the refugee women entrepreneurs or this forcibly displaced the refugee women entrepreneurs are getting enough attention because in academic such a, in academic papers and wherever you go there is not much that is said about these refugees and as I said that because most of the studies are confusing or are mixing both migrants and refugees in the same in the same pot which is not the same case and uh, when we were trying to look with all the statistics and all the 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 the, 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 the papers that we are reading about these forcibly displaced women entrepreneurs, behind them, it's not just the statistics. It's a resilient woman entrepreneur, a resilient woman entrepreneur who can make changes not only by for herself but also for the community around them. So. I would like to, if you can take a picture maybe of these um, references of uh, one, the first one is the academic journal, uh, a, a academic journal article in the, in the journal. And also another one is a book chapter as well. Uh, and also this, uh, the policy of no one left behind employability policy here in the UK. I felt that, well, this is very nice, uh, a good policy here in Scotland, which is good to share for people to know what's happening in Scotland. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dina. Um, you really set the stage in grounding your presentation in the context of um, displacement and highlighting the unique needs and, and opportunities and challenges uh, faced by these migrant women. Um, thank you very much. I will now uh, turn the floor to uh, Dr. Yvonne Riano, Associate Professor at the Institute of Geography um, at the University of Neuchâtel and Vice President for the Swiss Federal Commission uh, for Migration Issues. Um, and we will, I'm, I'm making note of all the questions in the chat, um, and we will turn to discussion after the three presentations. So thank you, uh, Dr. Riano, for being here with us. Uh, the floor is yours. Sorry, I'll just get you to unmute. Got it. There we go. Thanks. Okay. Hello, everyone. Pleasure to be here. Many thanks to the Migration Research and Publications Division for your invitation. I will be speaking about female entrepreneurship at the Colombia-Venezuela border in South America amidst armed conflict and displacement. So just to give you a brief institutional context of my research project on female entrepreneurship. It was funded by the Swiss National Center of Competence in Research for Migration and Mobility Studies, which is a network of Swiss universities that investigate migration and mobility issues. I led between 2019 and 2023 a research project on migrant entrepreneurship in three different countries, in Colombia, in Spain, and in Switzerland. There were three researchers, 
uh, Etienne Piguet was my colleague in co-leading this project. We, I also produced a documentary entitled Weaving Threads Across Borders, which gives voice to three uh, displaced migrant women entrepreneurs and um, gives them the opportunity to tell the story of displacement, of setting up businesses and their wishes for the future. So this is also with the idea of empowering the women in the sense of giving them the voice to speak about their own realities. So let me start with the research context. The, st the study area here at the border between Colombia and Venezuela is framed by the cities of Cúcuta on the Colombian side and San Antonio on the Venezuelan side. This border area has always been the most important gateway for commercial exchange between both countries. At the same time, it is the main point through which almost 5 million people from Venezuela enter Colombia, either temporarily or permanently. There is only limited presence here, state presence here, and few employment opportunities exist. Numerous illegal armed groups, including guerrilla organizations, such as the FARC and the ELN, as well as various paramilitary groups, fight for control of this territory, as it is where the largest proportion of Colombia's cocaine is produced. To conquer the territory, these armed groups threaten violently the rural populations, drive them away from the farms, and commit massacres against the civilians. Gender is a central issue for this conflict, as illegal armed groups use gang rape of women as an instrument of war. Among the women that I interviewed, all of them suffered forced displacement, many of them collective rape, and almost all of them had suffered from domestic violence. Unlike men, displaced women suffer multiple barriers, multiple burdens, sorry, to carry on with the small businesses. The trauma of rape, the trauma of domestic violence, and the double work of caring for children and the household, in addition to the work of producing and trading their products and services. In the early 2000s, as you know, Venezuela, Colombia's neighbor country, had an oil boom. This country was very rich back then and very attractive for many Colombians to go there and work, especially for those who have been displaced by the armed conflict. Many Colombians immigrated to Venezuela at the beginning of the 21st century, hoping for more secure lives. Many of my Colombian interviewees stated that they found many opportunities in Venezuela to flourish with their small businesses. In 2015, however, everything changed. What happened? In August 2015, a group of Colombian paramilitaries invaded Venezuelan territory to search for guerrilla groups that had taken refuge over there. Instead of killing the guerrilla fighters, however, they killed a member of the Venezuelan police. In retaliation, President Maduro decided to place the international border between Colombia and Venezuela under military control, as you see here, and closed it indefinitely for vehicle transportation. The border people was thus prevented from crossing the official border between both countries, which had been forever the main uh, means of survival for socioeconomic exchanges across the border and for cross-border mobilities on which the local populations had always relied on for the livelihood. This border crossing remained closed until 2022, so seven years in total. At the same time, President Maduro also decided to forcibly expel 25,000 Colombian migrants living in Venezuela, accusing them of collaborating with the paramilitaries. Colombian migrants were forced by the Venezuelan military 
to leave Venezuela overnight without any previous investigation or legal basis for these mass deportations. They had to flee with only a few possessions on their back and cross by foot the Tachira River that separates the two countries to get to Colombia. Once in Colombia, they found little support from the national government. Besides, they did not qualify as refugees as they had to flee to their own country. Since 2015, such displaced Colombians have been struggling to survive without state support and the daily threat of the ongoing armed conflict. How do the displaced Colombians react to this situation? Women in particular showed an incredible power of resilience. Despite their gender specific traumas and often the absence of the children fathers, they mobilized remarkable strength to carry out a variety of small businesses which serve the purpose of regaining control over the lives, surviving and caring for the children. As you can see in the images, they set all kinds of small businesses, ice cream selling, handmade decorations for parties, t-shirts, jeans, uh, shoes, bags, but also services such as beauty services, headdressing, and very interesting, also social support for all the female victims who have been victims of the armed violence. Now, what is interesting is that producing in both, producing in Colombia and trading in Venezuela is essential for the survival of their businesses. For the trade, they use location specific advantages such as the abundance of goods in Colombia to buy and the, scarce, the scarcity of basic goods in Venezuela to search. Besides, there is only a very short distance between the Colombian city and the Venezuelan city. And so they actually have been crossing the border since 2015 along this informal path because the official border is closed. You can see here the International Bridge is called. So many of the local residents with the women set up an informal path across the jungle and crossing by foot the Tachira River to trade, to produce in Colombia or buy and to sell in Venezuela. These informal mobilities, because they are actually informal mobilities, became one of the main forms of resistance against the, the, the ban of the crossing the official border. These trochas, as these paths, informal paths are known, are today a main source of survival for many displaced migrant women. But these informal mobilities would not be possible without the social and business, work, uh, business networks that women have built over the years across the borders. So they have family and commercial uh, networks on the Colombian side, as well as the Venezuelan side. So this is a very interesting strategy, but at the same time, a very dangerous strategy as the ELN guerrilla is situated here across the Trocha, controlling the passage of the Trocha and collecting attacks from the people who pass by. Anyone who refuses to pay can be killed and women are at constant risk of being raped. The lack of state presence and armed violence threaten the future of women's small businesses as well as their cross-border social networks. So what have we learned from my research? I think that First of all, it is very important to recognize that migrant women displaced by armed and state violence are not simply victims of violent conflict. It would be wrong not to recognize this resilience and this capacity to act. They're built on the long year experiences of transnational mobility, of the knowledge of both local and international markets because they know both the Colombian and the Venezuelan market for selling and trading very well. 
great initiative and resilience. And thus they create these cross-border businesses, which not only guarantee their survival, but also have a very interesting social impact because what they have done is keep the border social fabric alive, despite the fact that immobility was imposed on the residents of the area when the border was closed by President Maduro. And also my argument is that they contribute to peace efforts in this region. Why? Because they create, potentially create employment opportunities, especially for young men who have no other alternative but to work with the violent uh, armed groups. So how to strengthen women's businesses? I think that first of all, it is very important to recognize that women have limited resources, limited support, and that besides financial support with small credits and logistical and uh, educational backing, they need in, in particular support to tackle gender-based violence and to facilitate reconciling childcare and income earning activities. And when I talk about support to tackle gender-based violence, I talk about legal support. So far, there is no frame um, to protect them from that violence, legal frame. And as I said before, they are not seen as refugees because they actually fled to their own country. This is a, a kind of legal vacuum in international support for displaced people. Also physical, so that they can cross the trocha, this informal path, without fearing armed violence and psychological as well, because despite the trauma and lack of psychological aid, they keep going with their businesses. Um, I also think that it is very important to recognize that transnational small businesses has become today a feature of economic activity for many mobile people in countries of the South. So it is no longer uh, something that is restricted to the national realm or to the local realm, but many migrant women either trade across the border, the immediate border, or travel to other countries, buy in Dubai, for example, and sell in Africa. And these transnational small businesses are essential um, activity for them. So I think that if we want to support them effectively, we need to recognize this transnational character and use an approach that effectively capture the totality of the spaces of economic activity, ranging from the local to the national and international scales, as well as the actual social spatial extent of their social and commercial networks. And this is very interesting because these networks are not only based in the countries where they live, but also across the border. And last but not least, I think that often we um, use a migration perspective exclusively. Um, and I think that using a mobility perspective can help open new windows of understanding because not all women are constantly migrating or in migration. Some of them, some of the women I interviewed migrated to Venezuela for some years, but the rest of their lives, they were leading mobile lives between Colombia and Venezuela. So by using a mobility perspective, you have migration. Migration is a form of mobility. Then you can recognize how um, this women's entrepreneurial activity unfolds during both migration and non-migration periods. And again, large numbers of women, not only in Latin America, but also Africa and Asia, are not always in migration, but regularly on the move to trade between two or more countries. So that is all for today. I hope that I inspired you some thoughts and I also encourage you to take a screenshot or a picture of my publications if you are interested to know more about the topic I'm investigating. Thanks so much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Yvonne. Uh, that was really lovely. And 
I think uh, very important to emphasize, as you did, uh, the agency of migrant women entrepreneurs, despite the ongoing armed uh, conflict and displacement. And you also highlight um, very specifically how transnational market markets are leveraged for uh, cross-border businesses, uh, not only for their survival, but to maintain the, the social fabric of that border region. Um, it's a really interesting context, and we will be sharing um, uh, your slides and your references uh, on the GenMig website for, for people to take a look at. Thank you very much. I will now pass it over to um, Senya Homel, a PhD candidate um, affiliated with the Institute of Social Prevention and Reconciliation and uh, Center of Migration Research at the University of Warsaw. So thank you, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to join this great webinar and also especially for, for, for technical issues. <laughs> thank you so much, Jenna, for, for helping to manage uh, this. My name is Ksenia and I'll, uh, today I will discuss our recent work to research projects on female migrant entrepreneurship in Poland. Um, on the next slide, you will see uh, there are two ongoing projects, uh, and I will focus on the Polish context. We are still working uh, with interviews in Italy, so I hope uh, I will share these results soon. And I will also um, focus on the analysis of interviews with the Ukrainian migrants. However, the scope of our research is broader, but uh, because we are running out of time, and I also want to present some some uh, results. Um, uh, and also recommendations I decided to limit um, to this to this group. Um, so uh, the next slide, uh, slide please. Um, to set the context, it is important to highlight uh, that Poland has recently uh, become an immigration country. Migration flows uh, here are diverse. Uh, however, the Ukrainian community is largest. Um, Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine has led to a significant increase in forced migration particularly women, uh, very often women with children and other dependents. Um, so we can see that women as a social group are very diverse, uh, that sometimes some studies can uh, generalize uh, and simplify this. Factors such as age, education, ethnicity, race, migration, background, legal status, and socioeconomic conditions all shape how they navigate uh, and uh, uh, engage in entrepreneurship in Poland. Uh, migrant uh, business activity is still uh, perceived in Poland as a new phenomenon, uh, but you can see um, in the graph that uh, there has been a sharp increase in the registration, for example, of sole proprietorship as uh, the most popular form of business activity in Poland. And uh, on the uh, um, slide, you can also see uh, that this increase was specifically visible among Ukrainian uh, citizens. Um, it is important to underline the legal changes that facilitated access uh, for Ukrainian citizens to business activities, in, including also those who already lived in Poland before 2022. So we can probably say that legal changes have helped to minimize uh, gaps and meet the growth demand for entrepreneurial opportunities among this group. And second. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, our research shows that uh, to understand entrepreneurial strategies, decisions, and uh, challenges, it is uh, important to consider a three-dimensional perspective and also how they intersect. Uh, at the micro level, uh, many participants spoke about their migration work experience, the difficulties in applying their professional skills and qualifications, uh, in Poland, it often results in a mismatch between um, their previous career and also new employment opportunities. For, for, for women, uh, entrepreneurship uh, became a solution to restore their professional status. Moving to meso level, uh, interviews show that social networks uh, can provide crucial support for starting and growing a business. Migrant communities uh, served as a first market, for example, but also we see that communities have their boundaries and it can limit also a broader integration into the larger market or mainstream market, uh, as, as we use uh, this term. 
At the macro level, uh, we can also see that a wider social and political context, including migration regimes and integration policies. Unfortunately, in Poland, uh, there is still a lack of long-term vision in migration and uh, integration policies. And uh, next slide, please. Um, there, all, uh, my previous uh, speakers highlighted some uh, examples of uh, disadvantages, such as a local uh, lack of social context or language barrier. So maybe I will focus on uh, administrative challenges. However, some uh, of them can be shared by uh, entrepreneurs in general, uh, such as uh, legal or tax tax uh, requirements. Migrant women can face additional obstacles related to adjusting to new business environment. Uh, for example, differences in terminology or legal requirements between countries uh, can be a source of confusion, especially for those who already had experience with, with business before migration. Uh, participants also highlighted the gender and migration related stereotyping, uh, which impact the ability to form equal partnership uh, or develop business uh, uh, at the local market. Um, there were also uh, such challenges uh, as um, long-term um, uh, procedures and the experience of institutionally imposed temporality, being stuck in different procedures uh, and having no access to, uh, to entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial opportunities. Um, on the next slide, I have some examples of uh, um, from interviews, uh, because for me it's important that behind statistics and analysis we have personal stories, but as far as we don't have time, we can move uh, to the last uh, slide with um, uh, empowering and, and the social aspect of entrepreneurship. Um, despite challenges, entrepreneurship has empowering potential and contributes to social change. Uh, from interviews, uh, especially, I would like to underline the aspect of self-support. Um, women I talked to um, developed themselves mentorship programs and workshops because they noticed gaps in uh, programs that were provided uh, to women migrants, so they decided to step up and initiate uh, um, mentorship uh, initiatives. Also, entrepreneurs uh, increase the visibility of migrant uh, women by participating in networking events, conferences. Um, they, uh, they initiated partnership with social organizations, and also they advocate for, uh, for needs and also for potential of migrant female entrepreneurs. Um, so to conclude, um, the next slide, uh, I would like to highlight uh, maybe two recommendations that we discussed during the interviews. The tailored support programs, it was already mentioned uh, at the previous uh, presentation, especially uh, programs that include the aspect uh, and the needs um, of women living in reception and migrant centers or women who just received protection status because sometimes during uh, being in these institutions, they actually uh, can have limited access to, to networking programs and to entrepreneurial programs. Um, for example, some participants uh, underline the importance of several month mentorship and funding assistance as a good examples that allowed them, for example, to develop uh, their uh, dreams into actually a, a business. And the, the, um, the second recommendation uh, would be the strengthening cooperation and networking between business and support entities. Um, this is crucial uh, to ensure that women have, have access to resources and also can develop business partnership, increase their visibility and improve the sustainability of their uh, ventures. Um, so I think by addressing these issues, we can not only support uh, entrepreneurs, but also enhance the, the overall uh, social cohesion and business development. Thank you. I was trying to make it short. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Um, it's great, again, to highlight the, the intersectional challenges uh, faced by migrant women entrepreneurs. And you also underscore um, like like the other panelists have done, uh, how migrant entrepreneurship fosters a sustainable social change. 
So the, the cohesion across the presentations um, work very well together. I will take uh, one question starting uh, from the chat um, from Yoris Amin um, to reflect on uh, as as your presentations have uh, focused very closely on the, in the context of displacement. Um, so the impact of trauma on entrepreneurship endeavors and how to mitigate this and support uh, migrant women in these contexts. Uh, so if anyone would like to take the floor first. Uh, so again, to, to reflect on, on the impact of trauma um, on entrepreneurship, migrant women entrepreneurship, and um, what this, how this was realized in, in each of your different uh, fields of research. Dina, please go ahead. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, and uh, thank you for the person who have asked this question on the chat box. Yeah, it's true that um, the women that we spoke with in our sample, I will give you one example of a woman who said that, well, who gave us the scenario of how she left her country. And at the time when she was leaving her country, she was forced to, 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 to run by night and walk in the forest is in rains. And uh, there was a certain time because she ran with her daughter, her daughter was raped and she was killed and she kept going because she didn't she couldn't go back and on arrival when she arrived here in the UK she was uh, before even being processed so she was down in England and uh, there uh, the migration officers with all the arrangements of trying to to arrange these people give them the accommodation and make sure that they are safe so they 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 had a dispersal policy uk dispersal policy of uh, finding accommodation and, and relocating locating these um, these uh, refugees here in the in the uk so these um, uh, here in scotland there were plenty of uh, um, council housings that were empty so because these houses were empty and in england there were no enough accommodations so they had to take those uh, uh, refugees from england and bring them here in scotland however what was happening during the daytime when they bring those uh, those migra those refugees in the buses then there was a time where local people they knew that were certain uh, high flights where 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 the places where these refugees were brought in so sometimes during the daytime when the buses are arriving local, local people will either shout and start yelling and just sort of giving all those um, and present languages calling them names while they're still in the buses and they're trying to just sort of embark on the buses to try to occupy this building. So the only way that the, 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 uh, the migration officers felt that it was safe to bring these people in the, here in Scotland was to transport these um, uh, migrants and making sure that they can arrive in Scotland, in Glasgow during the night time when the local people are sleeping. So it means that the, Night time, that's when the, the refugees will arrive and they will be given some apartment at night. They will sleep. And then by morning when they wake up, they wake up to see the, 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 their local people there, meaning that trying to avoid that. But it's still that, even that strategy, yes, it was safe for that because it, it is saving them from the, all those uh, nuisance of the local people who were not happy of, of receiving these people. But it's still, it was not pleasant for, for the migrants themselves. So this lady, she said that, well, she, when she was sleeping, she could dream of her daughter, what, what was happening with her daughter until when she, she, she died. And then when she arrived, she was struggling. She couldn't even go to, the, to, to, to buy food or to go out of her apartment because most of the time, People were coming bang, bang, bang on the doors and they would just want to give them all those nonsense languages, which again, because she couldn't even speak the language, all what she could see is that the anger and the, the frustration of the people whom she was meeting with them in the streets. So that kind of thing, you, you can just like imagine that she lived with it. And then by the time when we were interviewing her, she said that, well, I have lived with this for many years until when my GP recommended for me to go and see the psychologist. And by the time when we were talking with her, she was strong doing her business, but she still had some sessions with the psychologist to undergo through this. So this is the, the example. And because I saw also on the on the chat box, there was another person who was asking that, well, the, 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 there was various traumas that were happening for refugees in uh, in in the Netherlands, so they wanted to know 
what was happening or what is happening here in in Glasgow. So this is only one example. So um, the person who have asked me, Thank please you. take my contact and we can discuss or chat it out of the, the this this session. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, uh, Yvonne. Please go ahead. Sorry, just on mute. I, I also like to to bring some of the examples um, of a woman, for example, who was in the farm of her family, as many other Colombian farmers in this part of, of, of the country. And the paramilitaries simply arrived one day and said they have two hours to pack their things, otherwise they'll kill them. So they just have to run away. That was the very first step. She was still a teenager. Then they moved, they flee to another village near the farm. When they were living there and she was already um, a young woman, the paramilitaries came to the village searching for guerrilla groups and gave a warning to the local population to leave. Again, the whole population of the village has to leave. Um, otherwise, they will commit a massacre. And when the two hours are over, they start killing everyone. So that was her second displacement. Then she moved to Venezuela. And then the third displacement came uh, by President Maduro. And the hard part about that was that the Maduro's government said that the children of Colombians who were born in Venezuela were children of the Venezuelan state and that they would not allow the mothers to take the children out of Venezuela. So that was another great difficulty. Um, then she came back, uh, moved to a, a farm with uh, a gentleman she met, and the guerrilla arrived some months later, killed her husband, and uh, she was gang raped by women, by, by men, sorry. So... These are traumas that you cannot physically imagine how somebody can cope with that. And her, her way of, of coping has been to, and she says herself, to transform hate into love. So she, her business is actually a social business protecting women from violence. And this is how she deals with it. At the same time, I think that we as researchers and, and, and people working in international agencies can also uh, strengthen these women's uh, empowerment. For example, what I did with the video, it was an opportunity for them to reflect on what they had lived, to, to discuss, because I accompanied it with the trauma workshops to discuss their experiences collectively, and that helps a lot to overcome trauma. But of course, it's not enough. You need psychological support, but also, as I said before, legal support. I mean, how is it possible that in a country like Colombia, where five million people have been internally displaced and women suffer that kind of violence, that there isn't a legal, a strong legal framework to protect them and a strong physical presence of protection to protect their daily ongoings? So this is the example I wanted to share. Thank you very much. Celia, please go ahead. Thank you. Yes, I also wanted to add uh, the, the same um, aspect uh, because I think it's uh, important to underline that uh, the, the full scale in which the war uh, in Ukraine started not two years ago, but in 2014. So we actually were also... Um, we also have contact with people who experienced internal displacement before, and then the second international uh, uh, mobility, forced mobility to Poland uh, two years ago or a year ago. That's why this aspect of mentorship and self-support based on the experience was very crucial also because women understand the psychological aspects, the, the emotional aspects, and also um, I think that they actually... Uh, were able to provide more support that the organizations who were not prepared two years ago uh, as uh, experts, as um, assistants was, was crucial. And also now we can see that there are some um, 
women who established social organizations just to provide mentorship for entrepreneurs, for experts also to uh, provide this opportunity to use their the experience and to use the knowledge uh, back uh, uh, from, from uh, that women have before migration and they can apply it now. Thank you very much for sharing um, these insights. Unfortunately, I don't think we have more time for, for more questions, but it uh, would be nice to talk for another hour with you all. Um, I will now pass it on to uh, Celine for some closing remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Jenna, and thank you to all uh, attendees for all your questions and for being and uh, bearing with us, actually, for the two minutes uh, that we late. Uh, I'll be really short. Just a big thank you to uh, our speakers today. Uh, that was very interesting. And um, we, I mean, we identify speakers and, and try to have uh, a variety of contexts. But here, uh, as Jenna mentioned before, we can see some cohesion in your findings while in, in very different uh, geographical locations in terms of, of your research. So thank you very much. That was very interesting and uh, I hope everybody enjoyed. Uh, if you have any question, please feel free to contact us at research at iom.int. Uh, we do also have our GenMIC website uh, where you would be able to find the recording of this session. Feel free to share with your network. And thank you again very much. I wish you all a very nice day uh, or evening, depending on where you are. Thank you. <laughs>